Welcome to the Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association's Patients Come First podcast series. Podcast episodes are available on VHHA.com and popular podcast hosting apps, including Apple Podcasts, Amazon, Spotify, and many others. We're a member of the Public Health Podcast Network, the Virginia Audio Collective, and the Family Podcast Network. Podcast episodes also air each Saturday at noon and Sunday at 10 a.m. on 100.5 FM, 92.7 FM, and 820 AM across Central Virginia, and Wednesdays at 1 p.m. on 93.9 FM in Richmond. Please send questions, comments, feedback, or guest suggestions to pcfpodcast at vhha.com. That's pcfpodcast at vhha.com. I'm Will Seldon with VHHA, and today we're pleased to be joined by Dr. Vinay Kumaran, an experienced transplant surgeon with VCU Health who's been involved in more than 800 living donor transplant surgeries during his career. In a moment, we'll discuss his work and more, but first, welcome to the show, Dr. Kumaran. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Well, I want to start by learning a little bit more about you and your transition from practicing medicine in India, where you were born and educated to come into the U.S. to work with VCU Health and the Hume Lee Transplant Center. So from what I gather during some brief research before this conversation, you studied at the Maulana Azad Medical College in Delhi and then completed a fellowship in multi-organ transplantation before moving to Mumbai to establish a new liver transplant program. And again, from what I've read, it seems like living donor transplants have been a little bit more common in other countries than they are here. So can you tell us about the professional journey that brought you here and some of your observations about the difference in organ transplant practices here compared to some other places around the world? I came to the U.S to basically learn liver transplant. When I was doing a residency in surgery in India and then a fellowship in uh, gastrointestinal surgery, the brain death and organ transplant laws had just been passed. So that was when liver transplant was just starting in India. There were no established programs in India where I could get trained. So that's how I ended up coming to the U.S. and doing a fellowship in uh, UPMC in Pittsburgh. And then I went back after my fellowship and joined a transplant center in Delhi, which at the time was probably the first really successful transplant center. And our work there was predominantly living donor liver transplant because in India, the systems for declaring brain death and curing organs and transporting them were still not mature at that point. So we we only very occasionally did transplants from brain-dead donors. Most of our transplants were living donor transplants. And because there were only a few centers, the whole of liver transplantation was basically siphoned into those few centers, which became very high volume. So that's how I ended up doing the living donor work that I did over there. Gotcha. So from what I can understand, maybe the reason that living donor transplants are more common there is because of how people understood some of the the medical rationale or even ethical reasons for why you would be able or not be able to use organs of folks who passed away. Is that fair to say? Yeah, the systems weren't mature yet. It's picking up now, but until recently, most liver transplants in India were living donor transplants. Interesting. Well, just for the benefit of our listeners, a living donor transplant occurs when a living person, as the name would suggest, donates an organ or part of an organ, such as the liver or kidney, for transplantation to another person. Those folks are generally family members, such as a parent, child, brother, or sister. So with that brief explanation, can you give us a little bit more information about that type of transplant and its benefits for patients? So the amazing thing about the liver is it has a lot of reserve. You can remove up to 70% of a normal liver safely. And it regenerates, so the remaining liver will grow back to its full size. So that's what makes the operation possible. And the multiple advantages, the obvious one is that there is a gap between how many livers are available from brain-dead donors and how many patients need transplants. So some of the patients who go on the wait list for a liver transplant are going to die before they get an organ or they're going to get too sick for transplant and get taken off the list. So if they have a living donor, if someone wants to donate for them, then they don't have to face that risk. The other advantage is that the way organs are allocated, when a liver from a brain-dead donor becomes available, the idea is to allocate it to the sickest patient of that blood group on the wait list. And that works well in terms of saving as many lives as possible, but it's not ideal for the patient because they have to wait until they are sicker than everyone else before they can have a transplant. 
Whereas with living donor transplantation, uh, we can do the transplant much earlier in the course of the disease and so have a easier recovery from transplant. And of course, the other advantage is that the organ doesn't have to be transported from another city. You don't have that long period of many hours when the liver is sitting on ice before you can put it in. With living donor transplant, you can synchronize the donor and recipient operations and basically have a very short, what's called ischemia time. So both short-term and long-term outcomes are better with living donor transplant than with going on a wait list for a deceased donor liver. That makes sense. You touched on something that I think is really fascinating here, and forgive me for going on this tangent. So you talked about how livers have this sort of regenerative property, and that's why you can take, I believe you said, up to 70% Mm -hmm. of a living donor of their liver. What is it about the liver that makes it regenerative as opposed to other organs, which obviously don't have that quality? And what does that say for the future of organ transplants and biomedical innovation going forward? Or does it have anything to say? Maybe I'm just grasping at straws here, but it sounds interesting. Yeah, it is. And people have been working on uh, ways to make this work to overcome the organ shortage. So there are people working in labs to grow livers from stem cells. And uh, that's still in early stages of research, but they've got to the point where they're growing like liver organoids, which are like tiny livers. Uh, They haven't yet got to the point where they can grow a full-size liver, but I think in future that's something we're going to be looking at. Eventually, hopefully, science will get to the point where you can take a few cells from a person and grow a liver from their own cells and put it back into them, which would which would basically do away with the need to suppress their immunity because they're getting a liver from someone else. So that's the dream, eventually. Right. Well, hopefully we're not too far off that. That's really cool. So I read an article about a recent living donor transplant involving the VCU team in which a daughter was able to donate part of her liver to save her father's life uh, that you were involved in. And, And this procedure involved robotic surgery, which is sort of the other aspect of this story. As I understand it, in these cases, robotic assisted surgery may be appropriate for the healthy patient, so in this case the daughter, but not necessarily the sicker one who is the father. So can you tell us about that distinction and maybe the pace of technological advancements? How soon can we expect procedures to be completely done with robotics? So we've got to the point where we're doing part of the operation using the robotic instruments. And the advantage is ultimately you have to make a big enough incision to take out that 70% of the liver. So you do need an incision, but the advantage of doing it robotically is you can site the incision in a place which is less painful. You can make use a smaller incision, and all those would make the recovery of the donor comfortable. As the technology matures, as we get better robotic instruments, I think we're going to get to the point where we can do basically the whole donor operation robotic. And in fact, there's a couple of reports from Korea of even the recipient operation being done uh, robotic or laparoscopic. So in the more distant future, we may get to that point, but early days yet. On that subject of advancing technology, I know we touched on this briefly, but what are some medical innovations in the pipeline related to organ transplant other than the robotics that you anticipate will come over the next, I don't know, five to 10 years? And how do you feel like they'll change your specialty? So in the short term, one of the things which is growing rapidly is the use of the pump for the liver. So uh, this is what's called normothermic preservation. And basically what's done is after the liver is procured, it's put on a pump which circulates blood through it. And there's an oxygenator which provides oxygen to the blood. We use blood from the blood bank to perfuse the liver. And The advantage is that the liver is uh, not sitting on ice without any metabolic activity, without any oxygen supply during this period. And you can actually see if the liver is working or not. So uh, when the liver is on the pump, it makes bile and it clears metabolites from the blood. Many livers which would otherwise be discarded as not suitable for transplant, if you can put them on the pump, then you can see if they're going to work or not. And the other advantage of the pump, of course, is that not ischemic while it's on the pump. It's got a blood supply. It's got a supply of nutrition. So there's no clock running. You can do the transplant with a much longer time between procurement and transplant in a much more controlled way. And there are labs which are working on 
keeping the liver on the pump long enough to actually repair a fatty liver, for instance. If you can uh, keep the liver on the pump for a week and reduce the amount of fat in the liver, then you can convert a liver which is not suitable for transplant into one which can be transplanted. These various pumps and what's called normothermic perfusion of the liver is one of the things which is likely to change transplantation in the next few years. Wow. That's fairly miraculous. And I have to ask this follow-up question. So what's your perception of your relationship between your own skill set and these medical innovations and robotics coming in? And I guess what I'm asking is, how open are you to these innovations? Are you excited by them? Are you concerned by them? What's your general take on all that sort of stuff? I look at them as tools to perform the operation better. So, for instance, in our team, we have Dr. Sung Lee, who's a very skilled robotic surgeon. So uh, he's leading this effort to start doing the donor operations using the robot. But eventually, I also plan to learn how to use it and uh, begin adopting uh, uh, robotic techniques to do the donor operation, at least. So it's a, it's a tool. The operation remains the same. But the way we operate gets better. We have better magnification. We have instrumentation. It can be moved in ways which our fingers and hands cannot be moved. I think it's going to make us better surgeons eventually. So just before we close out, it's tradition on this podcast to ask our guests a few more fun personal questions just to finish things off on a light note and to keep sure. our listeners on their toes. Um, we've developed a list of 10 mystery questions. So when you're ready, if you give me two numbers between 1 and 10, I'll ask you those corresponding questions. Uh, let's say 5 and 7. Alrighty, 5. If you could spend the day with one person from history, living or otherwise, who would it be and why? Oh, uh, wow. Well. I think it should be Einstein. I've always been fascinated by physics and how much more basic the questions which physicists ask are than what the rest of us deal with. Uh, and he sounds, from from whatever I've read about him, like a kindly elder uncle who wouldn't mind mm. answering questions. So <laughs> Einstein is whom I would go for. That's a great answer. I like that one. Okay, and then number seven. If you could choose one superpower, what would it be and why? X-ray vision, I suppose. So X-ray I vision. What's happening inside? So I could see what's happening inside my patient yeah. without resorting to radiology. <laughs> An appropriate answer for a surgeon, that's for sure. That's for sure. <laughs> um, well, those are two great answers, and with that, we have come to the close of another episode of the Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association's Patients Come First podcast. If you liked what you heard, please make sure to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and subscribe so you know when new episodes are released. We want to once again thank our guest, Dr. Vinay Kumaran from VCU Health, for joining us today. So thanks so much. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for having me on.